You're watching Reason and Theology Live, a show dedicated to charitable discussion, debates, interviews, commentary, and analysis. The show concentrates on theological topics, historical matters, and philosophical problems with content ranging from introductory material to in-depth examination. And now, your host, Michael Lofton. Welcome back, everybody. Your host, Michael, on a Thursday evening, joined by my friend here, Timothy Flanders, who is the host of Meaning of Catholic. Go check it out and subscribe if you haven't already. Uh, great to have you back on, Timothy. How are you? Yeah, it was a pleasure, brother. Uh, doing very well. Jesus is king. How you doing? It's uh, It's been maybe a month, month and a half since the last one. Is that about right? Uh, yeah, something like that. In a little while. And this one's going to kind of continue the uh, previous stream that we did. We're calling this one The City of God Against Pagans. And what I'm going to do, Timothy, I'm just going to let you take it away wherever you want to go with this. And uh, I'll ask some questions here and there. Uh, but everybody else, y'all please hold off on your questions until towards the end. Um, I'll, I'll let y'all know in the chat when it's appropriate to go ahead and start sending them. Whenever you do, make sure to send it to at Reason and Theology. But uh, uh, if you're if you're ready, Timothy, go ahead and take it away. Yeah, sure. So, yeah, I'm from Meaning of Catholic. Uh, that is a lay apostolate that I run with some other people as well. Um, so the last show was called Cultural and Social Factors in the East-West Schism. Mm -hmm. And in that show, we talked a lot about the Pontifex Maximus within Roman pagan religion and how that affected the development of Christianity. And tonight we're going to talk about another concept, which is the goddess cult Roma in opposition to St. Augustine's great, greatest works, City of God Against the Pagans. The full title of the book is De Civitate Dei Contra Paganos. So there's actually a contra that was written against the pagans. And we'll talk about that. This is coming out of the research that I've been doing for my book, which will be out this fall. And the title has been changed once again. It's actually going to be called City of God versus City of Man, the battles that have shaped the church from antiquity to the present. Mm -hmm. And so in this book, I'm trying to synthesize the work of the two greatest historians, in my view. And one of those historians is St. Augustine. So we talked last time about this Pontifex Maximus character. And the Pontifex Maximus is a corruption of true culture. And it begins with Cain, who does not offer the cultists rightly, according to the right of Adam, if you will. And he imposes his will on his generations, which leads to the uh, ultimately to the flood. But the Pontifex Maximus is basically this priest king. And what we're going to get to is that he's also the origin of the city of man according to Augustine. And the essentially what, what you see in the book of Genesis again and again is you see this building, is that people are building there, but there are two different lines of people in Genesis. There's the, the unrighteous line of Cain, and that line builds to exalt their own name, like Babel is the greatest example of that, let us exalt our own name. And then the righteous line is constantly building an altar and calling upon the name of the Lord. And so they are glorifying the name of God. And so these are these two different cities. So we're going to get into that in a moment with what St. Augustine does in, his, in this great work. But what, what you have in these various unrighteous lines you have this demonic corruption of culture where the demons are able to infiltrate this generational passing down of culture so that these generations are passing down a corruption of this original worship of the one God corrupted with various demons. And as we see in the case of the Greco Roman pantheon, all sorts of different demonic creations, which are, which the fathers call devils. Uh, Jupiter, Zeus, etc. Jupiter, Zeus are, are just Greek and Roman, the same, same high God. But Jupiter is corrupted by all sorts of other gods. Now, one of these gods is the goddess Roma. The goddess Roma is a 
divine personification of the Roman Empire. And this is just one instance of the same thing happening in all sorts of different empires. There is some sort of divinization of the empire itself. So we talked last time about the other main empire at the time is the Persian Empire. So they also have their own divinization of their empire. And so they have all this mythology. We think of Pharaoh. Pharaoh is, is a great example, ancient Egypt. So he's the Pontifex Maximus. He's the priest king. But there's also this divinization of the whole Egyptian empire itself as this divine manifestation of the will of the gods. And so this is just more rationalization by the Pontifex Maximus to rationalize his, his own bloodshed and his own sin and his own conquesting of other of his neighbors and and whatnot and so this is so roma in in the case of the roman empire is this goddess cult which develops before actually the imperial cult because it, it comes along before the imperial period in the first century bc but when the imperial car, cult comes along and there's this pontifex maximus cultus where they're offering incense to caesar they're actually doing so in coordination with offering incense to the goddess Roma, which is this personification of the Roman Empire. So this very much coincides with the Pontifex Maximus, as we said. Now, when our Lord is born, the church understands that, as St. Paul says, this is the fullness of time. And it, we read the prophecies of, prophecies of Daniel you find that there, there are these four beasts, which represent these four different empires, and the final beast is the Roman Empire. And it is under this beast that our Lord is born as Messiah. So the church understands that this is the fullness of time. They understand that the Roman Empire is special. Out of all the other kingdoms, God chose this time as the fullness of time. And it's a particular time period, which when you read the book of Acts, you see that St. Paul makes use of his Roman citizenship. And so there's a very providential working and use of the Roman Empire. But as we know, the Roman Empire persecuted the church for some almost 300 years. And we see in the book of Revelation, this very strong dichotomy between the, uh, the whore of Babylon and the city of Babylon, which is God's wrath pours out upon Babylon, contrasted with the city of the New Jerusalem, which ultimately comes down from heaven. And so there is this dichotomy between these cities. And this is what St. Augustine will pick up on in just a minute. But what we see also in this early period is you see this strong consciousness that Jesus Christ is the King of Kings. They adopt this title, as I said, I think in the last broadcast, they adopt the title of the Persians, which is King of Kings, and they ascribe that to Christ. They adopt the Roman title of Son of God. They, have, they put that on, on Christ. And there's other factors, obviously, from the Hebrew, from the Old Testament. But what's interesting is that they have this understanding that Christ is King over all the universe and over time itself. So here's a quote from the Martyrdom of of Polycarp, a very early text of the Apostolic Fathers, chapter 21, it says this. So this is the end of the document, and they're, they're wrapping up the document, the whole acta of the martyrs, and it says at the end, Polycarp was apprehended by Herodes when Philip of Tralles was high priest, Statius Gradatus was proconsul, and Jesus Christ king forever, to whom be glory, honor, majesty, and eternal throne from generation to generation. Amen. So there's this this coupling with Jesus, of Jesus Christ with the temporal rulers, because as, be, as viewers may be aware, in ancient times, they would date documents based on in the fourth year of so-and-so's reign. And that actually comes in the New Testament. They mention this in times. So in the fourth year of so-and-so's reign, this happened. In the fifth year of so-and-so's reign, this happened. But the early church from the very earliest times is identifying, and yet also Jesus Christ is reigning. So there's this consciousness of time being governed by Christ himself and he being ultimately the governor of church. And this is really the origin of our modern dating system. And we'll get to that in a minute. So, but there is this strong dichotomy and antagonism between the Roman empire and the church because the Roman empire is persecuting the church. 
But many Christians are protesting that they can be good Roman citizens, nevertheless. And so there's this split within the early church before the period of Constantine between the very strong anti-Roman sentiment of a man like Tertullian with the very strong pro-Greco-Roman sentiment of a man like Origen. And so there's this, there's this struggle in the church about how much can we adopt all of the Roman Greco-Roman culture. There's this worship of the em emperor. There's the worship of the empire itself in, in this goddess Roma. And what we see is after Constantine takes power and begins to promote the Christian church, what we see is that there begins to become a sort of Christianized version of Roma in the sense that Christ, some Christians are beginning to believe after Constantine comes to power, they're beginning to believe that the Christian Roman empire is the kingdom of God. And there's no greater exponent of this Christianized Roma idea than Eusebius. He is the one who identifies it in many works, but here's an oration in praise of a Constantine chapter three or book, book three, chapter two. He says, Constantine fulfills the predictions of the holy prophets according to what they uttered ages before. And he quotes Daniel and the saints of the most high shall take the kingdom. So in that verse, he's talking about these four beasts and he's thinking that Constantine's Christian empire is this kingdom of God. And so the new city of Jerusalem at the end of the book of Revelation is nothing else than Constantine building the church of the Holy Sepulchre. And so he is identifying the kingdom of God with the Roman Empire. And so there's this melding of this pagan idea of Roma, divinizing the Roman Empire with the Christian idea of the kingdom of God. So that is the Christianized Roma idea. And that's going to become a big problem in just a few centuries. Now, what happens in, well, in 381, we talked about last week when the, or not last week, last broadcast, when the Constantinopolitan Creed and the Council of Constantinople I in 381 elevates the Bishop of New Rome above the other apostolic sees in the East, it does so on the basis of an imperial authority. And now if you have the Pontifex Maximus and the emperor is the sacred priest, the high priest, you have this sort of Christianized Roma idea. All of this makes sense. It makes sense to elevate the Bishop of Constantinople above the rest because of all these things. If, if the Roman empire is really the kingdom of God, then the Bishop of the Imperial capital should be higher than these other sees. It doesn't, that makes sense. But what happens in the West sh shatters everything. It's in 410, old Rome, Rome in Italy, falls and is sacked by the pagans, by these barbarian tribes. And so this is a massive humiliation to the idea of Roma. It's a humiliation and a challenge to Roma, Eterna, Eternal Rome, the eternal city to be the last for eternity. How can this Roman city be sacked by the, by the uh, pagan tribes. And it challenges this idea of Eusebius. And what St. Augustine comes out to write, he comes out of the African tradition, which is drawing upon the Tertullian and, and the like, which is very antagonistic to the Roman empire. And he writes the city of God against the pagans. And in this text, he re completely repudiates the idea of Roma and the idea of a Christianized Roma. And he does this in this long text. So in translation, this is, so this is the penguin translation. It's uh, a thousand pages. And in books one through 10, all he does is just repudiate all Roman religion. And he's trying to win over the remaining pagans to Christianity by telling them that the sack of Rome is not, so the, the pagans understood that the sack of Rome happened because the Roman empire was abandoning the cult of the gods. The Roman empire was abandoning, worshiping the old Roman gods. And so go, the gods of Rome punished the city of Rome. And St. Augustine spends the first 10 books of, of city of God disputing this idea and repudiating 
all Roman religion using all of his knowledge of the Roman texts themselves. And this, so this summarizes what he raises up to replace it, which is the city of God. This is book two, chapter 29. The heavenly city outshines Rome beyond comparison. There, instead of victory, is truth. Instead of high rank, holiness. Instead of peace, felicity. Instead of life, eternity. And so he brings out these like this concept of the city of God, where it is the city of God is the true understanding of the kingdom of God. It is not merely earthly, but it's not merely spiritual. He go he defines it. He so if you are if you want to read this book, I would I would recommend uh, you can actually skip to book eleven and just read the rest because the first ten books are this really meaty refutation of the Roman pagan religion and many people do not practice that today, so it's it's not as relevant. But um, if you start on book eleven and start reading from there, he talks about the origin of these two cities and he goes back to Cain and I'll get back to that in a second. But he says this, this is this is this the famous line from the text where he defines what the city of God is. He says, uh, this is book 14, chapter 28. The earthly city, so we see then the two cities were created by two kinds of love. The earthly city was created by self-love, reaching the point of contempt for God. The heavenly city, by the love of God, carried as far as contempt of self. In fact, the earthly city glories in itself. The heavenly city glories in the Lord. The former looks for glory for men. The latter finds its highest glory in God, the witness of a good conscience. The earthly lifts up its head in its own glory. The heavenly city says to its God, you, my glory, you lift up my head. And so he actually begins the origin of the city of God really actually in the creation of the angels. Because the city of God is ultimately the community of all the redeemed. So it begins with the angels and it continues with the all of that righteous line through Genesis as this continues. And so the city of God is constantly building that altar to glory in the name of the Lord. And so he sees in Cain, because Cain not only becomes this Pontifex Ex Maximus, he also himself builds a city. And, and he, Augustine interprets this in, in book 15, chapter 18. He says that, I'm sorry, 17. He says this, Cain, we know, became the father of Enoch and founded a city in his name. This was the earthly city. Of course, the city, which is not just a pilgrim in this world, but rests satisfied with its temporal peace and felicity. Now Cain, whose name means possession, is the founder of the earthly city and Enoch, dedication, is the son in whose name the city was founded. This indicates that this city has its beginning and end on this earth, where there is no hope of anything beyond what can be seen in this world. In contrast with him is Seth, whose name means resurrection. He is the father of generations, which are separately listed, and we must now examine, etc. So he's identifying this origin of the city of man, Cain building a city, and he calls it after the name of his son. And we know in, I believe it's Genesis chapter 5, when Adam beget begets Seth, it says in the image of his, in his own image, he begot his son. And so man, the image of man, God in man is the sonship. Cain builds a city, names it after his son. He's sort of building his own image to himself and he's glorying in his own name. So this is the origin of the earthly city. And this is, so Roma is just one manifestation of the earthly city. And in the final books, books 18 to 22, he discusses the end and purpose of these two cities. They are mingled together, really ultimately, because the city of God is ultimately the church triumphant with the angels, the church suffering and purgatory, but not all of the church militant, because some of the church militant will end up damned into hell. And so the church itself is mixed with members of the city of God and citizens of the earthly city. And so this is this struggle of the church to seek the heavenly city and seek the kingdom of God in the midst of the mixture of sinners in her midst. 
But when he redefines and repudiates any Christianized version of Roma, he elevates the idea of citizenship as it is contained in the New Testament, which is when we're St. Paul and others say that we are strangers and pilgrims in this world. We are seeking the, the, the life of the world to come, as the creed says. So he elevates citizenship to the city of God. In the midst of the despair of the fall of Rome, he lifts up the mind of Christendom towards the city of God as their true citizenship, their true home. And this is what radically alters the course of Western civilization because this text is written in Latin and there's never really a counterpart to this in the East. And I'll get to that in a second. Um, I just want to read one more excerpt and there's so many different things. And another, another thing to remember when you read, if you want to read this text is that the ancient Latin rhetoricians would often go into digressions. And this was just a matter of rhetorical style that was prominent. So Augustine will go off on this sort of rabbit trail and he'll discuss all these philosophical concepts and then he'll come back to the main story. So this is why it's a thousand page book. Um, but that's one of the things that was great in its time and it still is as it endures. So here's one of the things that when, when they elevate the citizenship to the heavenly city, well, here is the result. This is uh, book 19, chapter 19. I'm sorry, chapter, chapter 17. He writes this, While this heavenly city, therefore, is on pilgrimage in this world, she calls out citizens from all nations, and so collects a society of aliens speaking all languages. She takes no account of any difference in customs, laws, and institutions by which earthly peace is achieved and preserved, not that she annuls or abolishes any of those, rather she maintains them and follows them. For whatever divergences are among the diverse nations, those institutions have one single aim, earthly peace, provided that no hindrance is presented thereby to the religion which teaches that the one supreme and true God is to be worshipped. And so this is this dichotomy which is able to be achieved by the Roman Catholic Church because it has the Latin tongue and the Latin mind. And that's what we talked about in the last broadcast, is that the Latin mind is able to administer multiple cultures. And this is what you see coming out right here in this passage in Augustine. And this is why when the East loses the Roman language, they also lose this Roman mind, and they end up with a Christianized Roma. And I'll get to that in a minute. But then Augustine continues. He says, Thus, even the heavenly city in her pilgrimage here on earth makes use of the earthly peace and defends and seeks the compromise between human wills in respect of the provisions relevant to the mortal nature of man so far as may be permitted without detriment to true religion and piety. And so what he's saying here is that there is a mixture of what will be called the temporal sword and the spiritual sword in other words, church and state, but the term church should also encompass the state because there is one community of the city of God. That, that is our citizenship. And so not only do we not scruple about the diversity of nations and languages and customs, we also have an organic fusion or an organic unity between the temporal powers and the rulers and the government and the clerical powers because they're all citizens of one city of God. In fact, let me, uh, if I can pull from this, this is a very good text that Emmaus came out with um, recently. It's called Before Church and State, um, Andrew Willard Jones. And he has this great quotation out of, this is a study of St. Louis, France. And um, so it says, uh, this quotes, uh, Vincent of Beauvais, he says, the whole church is made up of two orders, clergy and laity, as if two sides of one body. And this is the, the city of God's citizenship, which is both clergy and lay people. And here, let me, let me uh, read from another quote on the city, the city of God. 
Um, this is, uh, what was this, Stephen? I'll get the quote if, if someone wants the actual source of this, but this is another medieval canonist, and he says this, in the same city and under the same king, there are two peoples and two authorities. The city is the church, the king is Christ. The two peoples are the clergy and the laity. And so there's this concept, there's, there's this concept that there is no church and state. It's just the city of God, which first includes the angels and saints, the souls in purgatory, and then the souls on earth. And among them, there is this mingling and cooperation between the temporal sword and the spiritual sword. So this is, this is what radically alters this Western civilization. Because when Rome falls in 410, many Romans flock to the east. And in the east, there is the growing city of New Rome. They have wonderful technology. They have the great aqueduct, which powers water. And you can, I believe it's still, I don't know how much of it's still standing or used, but it is, it is this great aqueduct, which powered water from miles away into the great city of Constantinople. I believe it was the greatest aqueduct at the time. And then it also has the Theodosian walls. And so there's these layers of walls that keep Constantinople safe. And so there's this great confidence in the city of New Rome. And it's th this great technological advanced city. It is strong against the pagan barbarians who cannot come and sack it like they did with old Rome. So it's easy to understand that there would be an ascendancy at, just as the, the idea of Christian uh, Christianized Roma was in decline because of a St. Augustine, it was really on the increase in the East because of the greatness of Constantinople. And as time goes by, there's the rebuilding twice of the Hagia Sophia. Eventually there's the Hagia Sophia by uh, Justinian. And this is this great monument, which is functions culturally as a triumph arch of a Christianized Roma. Now, when the Bishop of Constantinople is raised to a higher, a higher standing because he's connected with the earthly city, the, the Roman Empire, there are these lines from St. Gregory Nazianzen where he actually satirizes this elevation. And he, he satirizes it by saying, you're, by elevating the Bishop of the Imperial Capital, you're saying that the church should be governed by the principles of the earthly city. He says this, this is um, Carmen de Vita Sua, starting at line 1690. It is right, they said, that in the church things should follow the course of the sun and that they should have their origin in the same part of the world where God himself deigned to be revealed in human form. And so it's this defining of the church by the earthly city. Now, if there's a Christianized Roma, if there's a Christianized Pontifex Maximus, again, it makes sense. Now, but there's an interesting phenomenon that happens when you trace this idea of Roma and how it kind of gets disseminated in the East through the sacred emperor, the Pontifex Maximus, who still uses the rights of the imperial priesthood into the ninth and 10th centuries. There are still rituals on the book but they have a dating system of it's either the rulership of the emperor in the fourth year of the emperor, et cetera, or anno, anno mundi, which is the year of the world. So there's this, there's this dating system, which is still pagan. Basically, this is the same dating system they used before, before Constantine. And there's still these remnants of a Christianized paganism. And what we see in the struggle between East and West in the period of the ecumenical councils, and as you see this same thing playing out, where again, Justinian is, is the perfect example because he really acts as the Pontifex Maximus, decreeing dogmas and working out decrees with the church. He's raising his own, he actually builds his own city that and names it after himself, Justinia Prima. And he tries to raise that city to a height in ecclesiastical authority because, because of the earthly city. So he's actually doing the very thing that Cain did, building a city after his own name. And 
so th- this is some this is this thread this is be which is behind all of these theological disputes there are these these pagan customs and pagan cultures which are influencing things and what's interesting as we continue is that the the idea of restoring Roma or some sort of Christianized Roman Empire continues in the East with Bulgaria. They try to restart a Roman Empire in Bulgaria in 913. Serbia does it in 1346. When Constantinople is sacked by the Mohammedans, Mehmed II actually calls himself Roman Emperor. And he's actually supported by the anti-Union Greeks who say he is the Roman Emperor because he appoints the patriarch of Constantinople, Gennadius II, who of course is an anti-Union Greek. And so the Mohammedans have a big role to play in the schism after Florence. But of course, there is then Moscow as the third Rome. And all of this is trying to replicate the prerogatives of the Bishop of Constantinople and replicate and restore this Christianized Roma of Eusebius. And so this idea of Roma and the Pontifex Maximus continues to play out in the East. And as St. Augustine notes, the earthly city is lording it over itself. And so it will, it will break out into these civil wars. And what you see in the Eastern conception of Roma, the central dispute is over who is the basically who is the true Roma? Who is the true Roman Empire? Who is the third Rome or second Rome or you know, New Rome or Third Rome? Who has the prerogative and the ecclesiastical discipline? And that's the origin of the current schism between Moscow and Constantinople. Now, what happens in the West that's different? Well, St. Augustine has the city of God, which is this again, there's no counterpart in the East. Now, the Roman Empire is restored in the West under Charlemagne. But what's interesting is that there is the same earthly city temptation with with Charlemagne and the Franks. And this this is what causes a great deal of tension, especially in the ninth century between the East and the West, because they both have a a Roma concept. But Charlemagne actually orders St. Augustine's City of God to be read during meals as this the City of God is continuing to be the foundation of Western political thought. And there's not the same competition between a concept of Roma in the West. They are not, each new power is not trying to arise and restore the prerogatives of a Roman concept. There's basically the Holy Roman Empire and people fight over the power of that, but France arises as France and they arise as they, they, claim their own prerogatives as the eldest son of the church or or Spain claims prerogatives as Spain, but they're claiming prerogatives eventually, especially after the refer- the revolt, Protestant revolt and the rise of it, an extreme form of nationalism. They are claiming an authority or a prominence based on their own nation. And so this is St. Augustine, as I, the last quote that I read, really repudiates the idea of making taking taking everyone out of these different nations and keeping their distinctiveness and so in the west there's not this sort of we're tr- constantly trying to restore the roman empire and compete about the concept of the prerogatives of the roman empire in a christianized roma church there is rather a, con- a competition between these different nations and so that's also a problem and there's also a temptation of the earthly city but there's not the same concept of roma which continues to get passed down and be, and be a problem in fact, they have to create a new concept in the Protestant revolt and eventually in the so-called enlightening, enlightenment or the darkening, the age of false reason of the 18th century with the American empire and the British empire. And they have to take the Augustinian version of providence and they have to change that into the concept of progress, the progress of liberty the progress of manifest destiny. They have to sort of invent these new ideas, which are corruptions of Augustine, but they can't uh, American. The American empire doesn't get founded and they say, well, we're new. We're the new Roman empire. We're the true Roman empire and that type of thing. This is not a, this is not a debate in the West as it is in the East between these different powers. So, and the, the key 
the key factor that I see is that Charlemagne, especially with Charlemagne, he begins to spread the dating system of Anno Domini, the year of our Lord. And so the concept that St. Augustine brings out in the city of God is that Christ rules over time itself. He is the ruler over the universe and all the nations, but even over time. And so that's why we begin dating our documents in the year of our Lord. And that is that is our modern dating system to this day, even though secular historians want to call it uh, before current era or you know whatever, it's still the same thing because it's still the same dating. Um, but this is what begins to be promoted. And it's really ultimately a fruit of city of God is that we date things by AD, not by the year of the Roman emperor or something like that. It is the year of our Lord. So that is the gist of the presentation. Um, and in my book, we basically trace, we trace Roma and how it plays out in the city of God versus city of man and how it affects the church and how the church combats it. And how this sort of gets, it gets reborn in a new form, as I said, with these different empires in the West, where they're trying to create something like Roma. They're not calling it that, but they're trying to create something like that. So it's the same old story, the same old dispute between the city of man and the city of God, which all goes back to St. Augustine. So that is you know, what role right. does the Roman Empire play in the church today what role does the roman empire play in the church today yeah because you you were talking about how the roman empire has played a role you know significantly in our history in some of these disputes what role do you think it plays today yeah great question i mean that this is this the same dispute that we're having with the all sorts of whatever they're trying to do with covid and create obviously that's another once again the city of man but what's interesting is that the west and the east adopt different things of the roman empire so the the i mean we talk about dioceses dioceses are roman and administrative uh mm -hmm. sections i mean the the ecumenical council itself is is basically a a roman imperial institution mm -hmm. that came about with the roman empire so we have ecumenical councils we have canon law. Canon law is uh, very much based on Roman law. Roman law mm -hmm. affects even today with common law and all the law traditions and jurisprudence. Um, so there's many factors that have come down to us. And I mean, the whole administrative system of the Roman Catholic Church still follows that ecumenical council pattern of the administration of the empire. So it has a, a massive effect on today. Do, do you think it's fair to say that what we've done as Christians is we've taken the Roman Empire and some of its concepts and elevated it? We've taken the city of man and we've incorporated it into the integrated it into the city of God? Yeah, that, and that's what St. Augustine says is he, he breaks with his other African uh, tradition, like Tertullian and whatnot, who see, sees this radical dichotomy between the Roman Empire, like we can have nothing of the Roman Empire. But he says that the things of the earthly city, essentially the earthly city in and of itself seeks the temporal goodness. It so, seeks the goods of the temporal world. And so peace as an absence of violence is a good that the church adopts and mingles with the earthly city insofar as it, it is merely seeking the, the temporal good. So yes, it is absolutely, that that's definitely um, the ideal that is attempted throughout Christendom is trying to bring together the, what they would call the, really they would, they would distinguish between the temporal sword as serving the common good and the, the city of man as the reprobate Christians or the reprobate going to hell, basically, because they're not only seeking the earthly goods, but they're seeking them in an evil manner. Speaking of which, do you think there's been a development here between the two swords and that that doctrine since the Second Vatican Council? Well, that that's an interesting, uh, very good question, and something that I get into my book because 
what starts to actually happen, it really begins to take off in the first Vatican Council when they don't invite lay powers to the council. And that yeah. was an innovation, a massive innovation. The, the French prime minister said at the time that Pius IX has decreed the separation of church and state by not inviting the lay powers to the ecumenical council. And so yeah. by this sort of de facto, and obviously we understand why he did it, I mean, the, the secular powers at the time were killing, you know, he, they just had, they had just slit his, his, uh, prime, his own prime minister's throat right in front of, you know, in, in Rome. So it was a, a period of revolutionary bloodshed. So it's understandable why he didn't do that, but there were unintended consequences, which basically created the church as a clericalist thing. So even today we think of the church, the, this, the church, that, but mm -hmm. when we say that we're only talking about the clerics and that is an innovation. Because as I as I was saying from this this book from Jones before church and state, there was there was just the the city of God, which included the lay power of the rulers and the priesthood. So Vatican II is the same thing repeated because there's not the secular arm, the secular power. Um, but there's basically the the big controversy with Dignitas Humanae. Um, the only way that I understand it to be interpreted properly is basically making reference to the church's legacy of toleration, toleration of, of Jews or heretics and giving them freedom in their own private order. Um, but what this ha ends up happening in practice is basically just a wholesale adoption of, of American liberal thought where we just need to have freedom of religion. Anybody can do whatever they want to. And there is no organic unity between the lay and the and the cleric. So I think it's it's complicated. I think that people sometimes people want to put all the blame on Vatican II or whatever, but I'm saying it's also a problem starting in Vatican I and all the whole 19th century. So there's definitely been a development and a corruption going on in the same at the same time in different areas. And it's just a very complicated situation because there are very few Christian commonwealths which are actually trying to achieve something like that anymore. So we live in this strange era and it's, it's a difficult time. <laughs> yeah. There's a question here. Uh, weren't the early popes in the first few centuries loyal to the Eastern Roman emperor? St. Galatius, for example, ascribes universal power to the emperor. What would you say there? William Ockham. I, I, I I'm not sure if you're an Ockham, Ockhamist, um, William, but, um, <laughs> Yeah, the well, in theory, the popes were citizens of Rome. And so Gelasius is the expositor of the two the two swords doctrine. So what happened was the yes, uh, basically in theory, yes, uh, to answer your question. Um, but what ended up happening was that the emperor in New Rome, continued to become a heretic and tried to push his heresy on the West and send his army to push his heresy on the West to the point that even the, and this is, if you read, um, uh, Echo um, the, I think it's the Byzantine papacy. If I recall the, the type of title, he admits that it was actually these Greek and Syrian popes who were actually starting to appeal to these Western Christians, these Western barbarian Christians to start to give them some military buffer against the heretical Greeks emperors in the East. And so at, at some point, the, so the, the Greek emperor keeps on sending his army, sending his army, imposes heresy, imposes heresy. And at some point they raise enough local army to beat back the heretical emperor. And so this is the beginning of this political breakdown which ultimately finds its fulfillment in the Charlemagne empire of 800. In theory, Charlemagne was restoring the original two emperors because there used to be two emperors in the East and the West, even in pagan times at different periods. Sometimes there was four emperors. And so in theory, this could have been the restoration of the full Roman empire, one in the West, one in the East, and they should have really worked together to do the same thing, but it was ultimately this earthly city mentality, this uh, mentality of Roma 
which began to break down. And, and the blame also goes to the Franks and the Charle and Charlemagne too. They also were saying things like the Greeks took out the Filioque and things like that. They were misunderstanding the, the seventh ecumenical council and things like that. So they were trying to find ways to disparage the Greeks as not true Romans. And at the same time as the Greeks were doing the same to the West. And so we have a breakdown of the whole Roman empire mentality because the true Roman empire, the Roman mind is uniting these diverse uh, bodies together. Um, but William of Ockham may be bringing out the, uh, what Ockham himself was trying to do, which was the, the sacred emperor in the West idea, which was promoted by people like Dante. And that was the idea that the empire, the emperor of the West is ultimately his own Pontifex Maximus. And he can appoint his own bishops without the Pope and there was a struggle in the West that was similar but different. Um, but it, it basically complicated because it's it's a body it's a body and soul relationship between the clerical and the lay class between the temporal and the, and the spiritual sword. It's it's a it's a organic unity. So at some sometimes the temporal sword is supporting the spiritual. Sometimes even Emperor Otto of the West came and deposed, de facto deposed at least. Pope John the 12th because he was a terrible corrupt Pope of the first pornocracy. But uh, at other times we have Pope innocent rebuking the Western powers and the Western Kings who are not truly going on true crusades and whatnot. So it's an organic unity and there's a give and take. So it, sometimes one is favored, sometimes another is favored. And that's kind of how it gets worked out in the messiness of reality. So another question here. Um, what is your thought on Charles Columbus' argument that Blessed Carl of Austria was the last Holy Roman Emperor? I, I, I defer to whatever Mr. Cologne has to say. But uh, first of all, <laughs> whatever I have to say on this topic is, is nothing compared to whatever Mr. Cologne would like to say about this matter. But it does seem to be that he does seem to be the last Roman Holy Roman Emperor. Um, another quick note because once again, Pius the ninth starts to alienate the lay power and Pius the 10th, in fact, does the same thing because Cardinal Rampola was elected to the papacy, but that was vetoed by the Austrian emperor. But then Pius the 10th is elected and he actually revokes the power of veto. And that's also just a, a further alienating of this organic unity of, of temporal and spiritual, but it does. Yes, it does seem to appear that blessed Carl is the last Holy Roman emperor the title was abandoned. Um, I forgot the name. I think it was Frederick. Uh, I, I don't recall the name. I think it was early 19th century when the, uh, the Roman, Holy Roman Emperor actually abandoned the title. So, But he was still, Blessed Carl seems to have still had the same mentality, that his job was to help coordinate these, these uh, warring peoples who are baptized Christians and help to implement Pope Benedict XV's peace plan. And uh, Cologne also noted in one of his broadcasts, he, he noted how the Holy Roman Emperor was actually fundamental in resolving the Great Schism of the West when there were three, three popes. So it's another example of this give and take between these two powers. So it's not as if one dominates the other, one, it's sort of they dominate in their own sphere and they work together as an organic unity of body and soul. You know, before I go on to the next one, let me ask this. Do you think that the uh, Roman Empire should be brought back somehow? I don't know how. <laughs> uh, yeah, do you I, think would say, I would say in theory, um, it would seem to be uh, def I, it's the only thing that's worked at all <laughs> with, with this mm -hmm. type of thing. But um, <laughs> there, there is ultimately there's this. Uh, like I said, this breakdown between these two emperors of the East and West Roman emperors. So at the very least, there needs to be bro brought back this organic unity between lay and cleric. And it's been breaking down since especially the 19th century. Hmm. Um, Nicolas, LOL, uh, <laughs> asked the question, how would we respond? Sorry, how would we respond to Protestants saying that because we use the term Pontifus Maximus for the Holy Father is proof that we have apostatized? Well, uh, it depends on the Protestant, I guess. Um, but um, Protestants just 
need to patiently and uh, with an open mind read church history. And when they read church history, their minds will begin to be opened um, to really understand those things better. Um, so adopting something, I mean, the, I think the best answer to the argument is simply to use the New Testament as an example, because as I, I think I mentioned this in the last broadcast, St. Paul himself uses the verb uh, triumph, the, the Greek verb triumph, which is the verb form of the pagan rite of triumph that we talked about last time. So he says he adopts a pagan term for a pagan ritual to demons. He adopts it and then uses it for Christ and says, Christ has triumphed over the principalities and powers. And so he's using pagan imagery, which everybody knows about, and he's using it to proclaim the truth. So this is just a use of a pagan term, Pontifex Maximus, to represent the truth of that the, the Bishop of Rome is the head priest of all the priests. This one is from Weinshull. The new Rome is purely administrative cultural, correct? So isn't the Orthodox claim of Constantinople being the new Rome problematical? Uh, problematic ecclesiastically. Um, if I understand your uh, your question correctly, um, yes, it is. Um, yes, it, it is problematic because the idea of New Rome was founded by the Roman Emperor Constantine as the new capital of the Roman Empire, and so why should an earthly empire dictate to the church its own ecclesiastical structure now there is a certain accommodation that the church has always made as i just said with with pagan things but the basic innovation that comes with new rome is that apostolic authority should be secondary to imperial authority and that's the that's the big innovation because Constantinople does not really claim an apostolic authority for what it does. It does it because it's an imperial capital. Now, there is a myth of St. Andrew, which is somewhat mythology, but um, it's ultimately the principle of apostolic authority, which is the governing factor of the church. And so, yes, it is very problematic, and that's really the, the biggest source of friction between the East and the West for centuries. There was a question on here. I misplaced it, but it was a, it was from Grant Michael effectively asking, what would you say about those who would say that the Catholic Church is the continuation of the Roman imperial state? Is It's effectively what he was asking. Um, well, there is a sense it is in the in the sense that there is the there are the papal states wherein the pope is in is literally a monarch of an earthly city. And he has his own army. And this was a problem because they were corrupt popes who were just trying to be like earthly rulers and start fighting people with their armies, especially during the Renaissance period. And to this day, there is the Vatican City, which is its own country governed by a monarch, the pope. So there is a sense of a Roman imperial state because there is actually a state. Um, but... And there's, as we said, there's an adoption of various Roman administrative processes and various things of Roman law and whatnot. So there's a great adoption and fusion of various Roman imperial things in the Roman Catholic Church. But ultimately, the Roman Catholic Church as a whole has not claimed the same ends as the Roman Empire, the same goals and defining characteristics which were defined by caesar augustus and the various caesars namely conquering the whole world through bloodshed that was the prerogative of the roman empire conquering the world establishing peace that was the roman empire so the roman catholic church has not followed the same prerogatives it's a different 
it's a fusion of uh, the Christian culture is a is is the logos of mosaic and Greco-Roman culture transfigured by logos incarnate. And so there's this great synthesis that is born as Christendom, which takes different forms. So it's basically a yes and no. There's one more on here that I wanted to ask. This one is from Kevin. Um, I'd like to ask if you've been able to dig up any information on Cardinal Rampola and the claim that he was a hidden Freemason. Well, uh, Mr. Simons, I, I, I believe we've talked privately actually about this this question. I think I think you actually know more than I do. And um, so... No, I, I, I don't really have anything but the rumors and uh, hunches, as you've shared with me. So, no, unfortunately, Mr. Simons, I don't have anything more to share on that point. Excellent. Timothy, I really want to thank you for coming on and, and doing this. Oh, here, here's one more from Ave. Why is Timothy so based? <laughs> I just throw that one in there. <laughs> you got to love it. Yeah, I, I've noticed people are using the term based a lot lately. Uh, I don't know if you, you've noticed that, but uh been spotting that in Catholic circles, Catholic and Orthodox circles. But like I said, I really appreciate you coming on and doing this. Um, any final thoughts on the topic before uh, before we, we end? Sure. Well, um, this um, the book that I wrote is designed to be just a layman's introduction to this Augustinian framework that we've discussed and trying to put this spiritual this theological vision of history back into our historical framework. And I think that when we do this and we look at history in, with this frame of mind, we can have a great deal of hope for the situation that we're in now. And we can look back on the history and the, and the, the triumph of the city of God over the city of man in every case. And we're just in another case like that. So my, my hope is that this book will help the faithful to, just get this frame of mind and try to restore this, which St. Augustine did. And uh, so I hope that that helps the faithful in some way. Um, so please pray that uh, it has some success in, in helping faithful in that, in that matter. And, and put in a plug for anything else that you wanted to as well. Sure. Uh, well, meaning of Catholic.com is, is our lay apostolate. And uh, we have a morning man show every Monday morning. We have a special 4th of July show coming up on Monday. And uh, also Kennedy's Hall's book, Terror of Demons, that will be uh, republished by Tan very soon. Oh, okay. um, so that's uh, what's, what's what's going on right now. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, cool. Awesome. But yeah, like I said, love having you on. Welcome on anytime. Shoot me some ideas and we'll do it again. Sounds good, brother. Thank you. Everybody, thank y'all for participating. I really appreciate your engagement there in the chat. Don't forget to like, subscribe, share this on your social media. By the way, check us out in about, it should be an hour, an hour and a half. We're going to have Dr. Lacutis back on with William, and he's going to do a debrief of his debate with Ubi Petrus. So that, that should be in about, yeah, an hour, an hour and a half. So I, I actually have to get ready to hook up the, the phone because Dr. Lacutis uh, doesn't have the capability of getting on video. So we got to get, uh, get some of the studio equipment in here and get it going. So I need a little bit of time to set up, but we'll be doing that tonight. So y'all tune in for that, uh, in just a little bit. And like I said, don't forget to subscribe if you haven't already. Also check us out, patreon.com forward slash reason and theology. If you want to support us and get access to extra content, see y'all in a little bit. God bless.